my name is Estrella Vargas and I'm a proud employee here at CAN TV. Today I have the honor of interviewing Ms. Jeanette Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us. You're more than welcome. Thanks for having me. And congrats for making it to the runoff. Thank you. <laughs> so today is a special edition of Political Forum when we interview uh, candidates uh, that have made it to the runoff uh, as the, real, the election approaches on April 2nd. Uh, this is a live show, so you can call in with any questions or comments for Ms. Jeanette Taylor. Uh, the number is below. It's 312-738-1060. So we're going to be talking about uh, Ms. Jeanette Taylor's platform and overall visions for the city if she is elected as the alderman for the 20th Ward. So to start off, can you tell us a little bit about your platform and what is different than like your opponent? So my platform is really based on what I've heard on the doors. People are concerned about economic development, they're concerned about safety, um, and just not being displaced out of the community that they love. And so to me this job is nothing but a community organizer with money. You organize around what the community wants to see. And so in the 20th Ward, we are blessed enough to get the Obama Presidential Center. So there is going to be a need for businesses and economic development. We just need to make sure that the people in the community are actually able to get on those jobs and benefit from the Presidential Center coming. Awesome. And so you led the 34-day hunger strike, which is impressive. And that resulted in the reopening of the Diet High School. Correct. So how does that experience translate to what you're going to do as the Alderman of the 20th Ward? So for us, we don't believe we could win. And so people told us that the school was closing, it was a dead deal, and that was it. And so after being arrested for civil disobedience, after blocking the the city hall elevators doors and after just hearing people tell us that it was going to close and there was nothing else we could do about it um, the hunger strike was kind of the last straw for us and people need to know two years ago when they asked I was like uh hell no I'm not doing that I eat all the time but <laughs> it was like I was willing to sacrifice what I needed to to make sure that young people in my community knew that they had somebody who loved them that they had somebody standing up for them and that they deserve a quality education regardless of what their zip code is and so for me it was just and I passed out after the tenth day and so for me while people begged me to get off I couldn't I had to stay because in a city where you just don't believe you can win and every time you turn around it's either a ticket or you're fine for something you can't afford food we live in a food desert the schools are struggling it was making sure that young people knew that there's a base of people in this city that love you and are gonna fight for you that's amazing. And so what made you um, want to be alderman for the 20th Ward? So if you would ask me two years ago would I run for alderman, I'd have been like, no, I like community organizing. But we got to get to the place where protesting sometimes is not enough. Um, going to jail is not enough. Going on hunger strikes is not enough. We got to be at the table to make policy. I tell people all the time, until poor people have a a, a seat at the table to make policy, our democracy is a sham. And so a lot of legislation is made around what people think instead of really sitting down with the people who are impacted and saying what are the policies that will help you that will move us ahead as a race. And so it's the reason why I'm running. I'm tired of people who make $120,000 a year who get a pension for the rest of their lives and they don't listen to the people who pay their taxes. In black and brown communities, people don't realize we're taxed at a higher rate, but we're never asked what we want to see in our community, and that has to change. And so it's why I'm running, and I want to, to light the fire and saying, this is how you transform your community. You transform it when you organize around what the people want to see. Awesome. So like you said, like hunger strikes and protests, they're not enough. Uh, but the high school closings or the school closings are still happening in the city and it's become a big issue so what are your thoughts about what cps has been doing to eradicate um, issues in the community so we need an elected representative school board we've never had one um the mayor gets so point folks and those points ha those people haven't advocated on behalf of the parents and the families in chicago public schools and so 
close they when you close people don't realize when they close 49 schools they put in an RFP to open up 49 charter schools so this wasn't about creating great institutions this was about making your friends rich and the study shows that the charter schools are not doing any better a third are doing better a third are doing worse and a third are doing the same and in education we should have winners and losers we know what good education looks like we're just not willing to do it in black and brown communities and two people are going on hunger strikes and in one of the richest cities in the countries that's sad it's very sad and so we need people that we could we could hire and fire just like with elected officials that city council it needs to be the same thing on the police board and on the school board period awesome and so should there be a moratorium on closings a permanent moratorium we just shouldn't be we shouldn't be building institutions that don't work in our communities people talk on the doors I hear a lot about charter schools they're too too much discipline so you're required to be a zero level what's zero level that means I can't talk so in the hallway I can't talk or standing in the square or we forgot that this young man who didn't come to school I can't remember if it was his tie or his belt he went home to get it and got killed that, that, that's never part of the conversation. We don't even talk about that. We sweep that under the rug. And so public schools, think about this. Woodline is maybe six or seven blocks away from Ray Elementary and Kenwood. When people can't afford the lab school, they send them to Ray and Kenwood. Why? Because those are quality public education places. So if you can do it in High Park, you can do it in Woodline, you can do it in Back of the Yards, you can do it in Washington Park. It's just about being priority. And our elected officials need to make us that priority. For sure. And so looking at the election, uh, it was there was a lower uh, voter turnout, so it seems like people are fed up with the status quo. So on top of uh, that, there's a negative rhetoric on like politics, especially here in, in, in Chicago. So what do you think needs to be done to motivate people to vote and to be involved in, in, in pol politics here in Chicago? Information and inspiration. I got to inspire you to want to be a part of that process. And then I got to be a part of the process. People are not going to fight for something they weren't a part of. And making sure that we're having the, connect the conversations about connecting the docs. Knowing that good schools lead to good employment. Knowing that good employment can lead to you owning your own business. People have not connected the dots in the city because we ain't even having those simple conversations. So one of the things that I want to do when I become alderman is to let people know what the process is of getting the having an ordinance calling it on the city council it going to a committee then it getting called and voting for people don't know the process but when they're at the table and you're asking them okay what does a good ordinance look like what do you want to see what could help you in your homes and it helps everybody around the city they'll fight for it and so I tell people it's not enough to vote for me you got you got to go to city hall with me I can't do this alone we got a bunch of institutions that in our community that get up every day to push us out and we got to fight that off and the only way we can do that is when we work together i love it so the current alderman um is not seeking re-election uh due to like a federal corruption investigation that he's going through and the last 30 years three 20th ward aldermen have been indicted so how are you going to help rebuild the trust in the community because after you know seeing all of that so i tell people i don't look good in orange it's not my color their baloney has no first name i like oscar my you go to jail you get the generic baloney that's not what i want and you gotta go to city hall with me when the people in the community are your kitchen cabinet when the people in the community are with you in those meetings they'll tell you don't do that I got an elder named Miss Tinsley, and Miss Tinsley, if she sees something on Facebook, if she hears something in the neighborhood, she gives me a call and say, we take the high road. We don't worry about what other people do. We worry about what we've done in the community, and your record speaks for itself. And so during the campaign, I go high. I ain't interested in what the other candidates are doing. I'm interested in letting people know what I'm doing and how they can work with me to make the communities what we want to see. And so that's how you stay out of jail. You bring... People tell me all the time, every alder we've ever had comes out of acts or I vote, I never see them again. I give people my personal cell number. Want to know why? Because you can't advocate for people who can't pick up the phone and call you. I'm not sitting in the office 24-7. I'm out in the field helping to change my community. And they got to come with me. Awesome. Honesty and... 
being transparent, us talking about the for my first 30 days is you get a copy of the budget of the office. You'll get a copy of all of the projects that were in play before I even had. You'll also get a copy of all the meetings that are set up. So when people come and say, I want to meet with you about a business. Who are they? Oh, they're the constituents from the community who live by the business that you want to build. So you got to it got to be OK with them. Me voting, my decisions on voting in City Hall will be influenced by the people in the community. If they say no, it's a no for me, sorry. My community doesn't want to vote for that. If they say something, yes, it's yes. Now, I don't want a casino. And for the most part, the majority of constituents don't want it. But if a vast enough majority of them say we want a casino, we're going to have to figure it out. Because at the end of the day, I'm just a spokesperson. I am the person they elected to advocate for them and fight with them. And so that's my job and that's what I got to do. Awesome. So yeah, a lot of the projects that are passed through the ward go to you, and a lot of aldermen don't, you know, they don't have a process. communicate with, right. with, with the community and everything is just like happening, and then people start seeing all these changes without even knowing why. Nope. And so it's important, like you said, yep, they'll already be at the table going, look, we told them no, it's a no. Take it somewhere else, especially when you can't hire half of the people. So 50 percent of the people that you when you build this business need to come from this community. You making sure that you support a school or a senior home because we have a bunch of schools and we have 20 senior homes in the 20th ward, making sure that you're able to support them. Will you hire somebody past 65? Because a lot of folks in those buildings want to work. So what are you going to do for the community? Other than roll thousand thousand dollars out because we spend our money. You gotta it, it has to be more than that. You don't do that in Lincoln Park. You don't do it in High Park. So don't do it in the 20th Ward. Exactly. Um, so as we talk about uh, the communities in the 20th Ward, your uh, specific districts cover different. Uh, can you can you tell us what areas? So it's Woodlawn, Washington Park. Inglewood, Back of the Yards, New City, and some are Greater Grand Crossing. Okay. And so it's a huge ward. And for the most part, people in Washington Park, New City, Inglewood, and Greater Grand Crossing have felt like the twenty only the twentieth ward is only Woodline. And so it's my responsibility to bring them in. And so that the first sixty days is us walking around the community, seeing where the bad spots are, seeing talking to neighbors and say, Hey, what do you think about this business that's in the community? Has it served us? What do you think they can do to improve? Making sure that we clean up. The twentieth ward has a trash problem that is just that's the least we can do. And so we'll have Saturdays where we do community cleanups in every part of the board. And so people will fight for what they what they had a part of. And so I want them to be there with me hand in hand. Awesome. So the park and school districts in in the 20th award own the most property. Uh, so that means that they have the most opportunity to reshape the community. Um, so how are you going to help rebuild the community when these institutions have like most say. So with the schools, making sure those schools are supported. And so one of the things that I've been talking with constituents about is using the TIF surplus to support those schools. A lot of those schools are starving. Um, they do, each school does something great, but getting them together on a consistent basis to say, hey, we have all of these free programs. You can use those free programs at the school. Making sure that the money that they spend is something that they actually need. So is the LSC involved in what's going in the school? How are the people surrounding the community play a part in this school? Do the stores donate to the school so you're not worried about food? Is there an institution that's willing to donate a bus to a school for young people to go on trips outside of the community? So it's us no longer working in silos and us using already what's in the community. And when it comes to the park districts, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. And so making sure that I'm meeting with the park districts that already exist to see what the need is and how do we get them more money and that they're able to have more programs that can support low income and working families. Because right now I'm up the street from Harris Park and a lot of folks can't afford it. I tell people all the time, I can only pay for those programs when I'm hood rich. That means when I get my taxes. And so in the summertime, most likely I won't be able to afford that. And so how do we make them affordable for families is we make sure that we're using our TIF dollars and we use state and federal money to support those institutions that we want our kids to be in. Exactly. So as we, 
um, move forward with this show. I just want to let the viewers know that if you have a question or comment for Ms. Jeanette Taylor, you can also contact her at 773-966-4707. This is her email and her address is 6636 South Cottage Grove. But like we said earlier, this is a live show. So if you do have a question right now, you can call us at 312-738-1060. We're here to answer your calls. And if we're here to listen to any of the comments you have for Ms. Jeanette Taylor. So residents in the 20th Ward overwhelmingly voted for the CBA, the Community Benefits Agreement, to protect current residents. But so far, the Obama Foundation and current city officials have rejected that idea. So it suggested instituting a 30% set aside for affordable housing, a property tax freeze, and funding for local jobs and affordable housing. So do you agree with the residents? Of course, definitely. Um, before I was running, I was part of the coalition, mm. and I still attend those coalition meetings. That is the right thing to do when you don't want people to be displaced from communities. I tell people my part of my story is I lived in Bronzeville, what, we, what used to be the low end. And all we got was the Harold Washington Cultural Center. My rent went from being $500 to $800. And I had to move. And so now I'm in Woodlawn. I pay $1,000 just for rent. That's not light. That's not gas. That's not cooking gas. And so when the, the, the Obama Presidential Center comes, they're going to start to, to hide. The property taxes are going to go up. And my rent will go from $1,000 to $1,500 if there are not things in place to... to um, Regulated. Cover the people who are already in the community. Mm -hmm. So long-time stakeholders, people who've already, people who stayed here before the investment deserve to stay. We already know anytime investment comes to the black and brown communities, low income and working families are the first to go. And that's, that's a shame. And so we can deal with trash. We can deal with blatant. We can deal with um, they're not being, we living in a food desert. We just got our jewels. We only had an Aldi's. We can deal with corner stores who sell flaming hot and juice but don't sell fruits. But now that there's investment coming, we'll change the people who are there and say, you're not good enough for it. No, not in the city. I was born and raised in Chicago and I love Chicago and I'm always going to fight for the city I love. And I'm going to fight to stay here. Beautiful. So you did touch upon gentrification. And gentrification is affecting the whole city and even the whole nation. So what kind of tactics are you going to use to combat combat that in the 20th Ward? So property tax freeze it, it, and the ordinance. And that's the thing. It's not, a, it's not something that we're asking the Obamas or the foundation to sign. This is an agreement with the city. Because think about it. That when they were talking about the Lucas Museum, all the money they were talking about spending. When they were talking about bringing Amazon here, look at the tax mm -hmm. breaks that they were going to get. We need, if you're using our tax dollars, we need to be able to benefit from it. They do it in other cities. We can do it in Chicago. We just don't want to. And so there are some things that we can stop gentrification. We ought to have a real conversation about affordability. What's affordable to somebody who makes $150,000 is definitely different than what somebody who makes $40,000. And them, us closing the loopholes and ordinances like housing for all. And so it's, it, it allows people to just pay a fine and not build affordable housing. Or what they'll do is they'll make single, they'll make a one bedroom and studio. No, you need to make family units. And so it's about protecting who is there, but also making it where everybody can come. I remember growing up in a community where my mother was a CPS clerk, my father was a cab driver. We lived across the street from a veteran. We lived down the street for somebody that worked at the neighborhood store. We all still lived together and we were all community. That's what we got to get back to in these neighborhoods. And so we can't be okay with the haves and have-nots. There, I tell people all the time, there is enough of the path for everybody to get a piece. Exactly. So uh, along with gentrification, violence is a huge issue, especially in the 20th Ward. And a lot of the solutions that politicians say uh, is a solution is policing. And so what do you have to say with that? And what do you think is the solution for so, violence? So, twofold. When jobs go up, crime goes down. 
People don't sell drugs, lose squares, or anything else if they are working and they are making a living wage. That's number one. Number two, us making sure that we have sustainable community schools. So for the last five or six years, along with the Chicago Teachers Union, we've been fighting for sustainable community schools. Um, Cincinnati, Ohio is a, a sustainable community school district. And those are simply schools that open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. They get an additional $500,000 a year to run after school programs. And what it does is it hires the teachers and the people in the community to run the programs and it allows everybody in that community to go to that institution. So I tell people I was I, I had social center when I was a kid. I didn't get home till almost 8 o'clock. I was too tired to do anything other than eat my dinner and go to sleep. Our young people don't have enough to do but they're always made the fall guy and the target for what happens in our communities. They Young people don't purchase guns. But young people will find something to do if we don't actively have something to do. Us thinking about how we do summer jobs. Every year it's the same set of kids, the same set of folks who are connected that get summer jobs. Making sure that we use some of that menu money, some of that tip dollars to employ these young people to do construction, to clean up their community, to come up with programs that they want to see. Because we all come up with these great ideas. Oh, we're going to make a social center. Oh, we're going to do this. And young people don't come to it. Yeah. They got to have one of the things that's happening in my office as we speak. I got a youth caucus that that's already started. And those are young people deciding what do they need in their community to make it. What do we need? And everybody is not going to college. That has to be a reality that we support the young people who don't want a college. So how do we get them in apprenticeship jobs to be in the unions, to be carpenters? A lot of the schools don't have those shops anymore. I went to Dunbar Vocational School and I went there and I took of business technology because I knew I was going to be a secretary because I had kids by the time I was in high school. Those opportunities have to be put back in the schools for young people. They don't even have home ec anymore. And so young people need to know that there's a choice. Making sure that we have universal health care. Making sure we have universal child care. There are some things we could just afford to do. We just don't do them. We're not investing. Exactly. In and because we don't have enough people saying that ain't right. That ain't right. And so I'm going to city halls to say that ain't right. And this is what we need to do. And people always ask, well, Jeanette, how are you going to get your other coworkers to do it? Because I'm ashamed of them. Is it okay for you to live in a safe neighborhood? Is it okay for your child to be able to walk to a quality school in your neighborhood? Is it okay for you to walk down the street and be able to buy fruits and vegetables? for your children? Is it okay for you not to worry about being shot or robbed? Then I should be given the same opportunity in my community and your vote will make sure that that can happen. Exactly. Because a lot of people don't see like the effects of a vote. They're like, okay, I have to vote. Well, all right. That's not going to do anything. Exactly. So it's important, like you're saying, to let them know that if you do vote, this is what you can do and what we can do. Exactly. It's like you Enough have some, everybody has something to bring to the table. I tell people all the time, my experience makes me who I am. But I never believe just because you got a bachelor's degree or a master that you're better than me. We all put our pants leg on one leg at a time and we're not better than each other. We're actually the same. We just have different experience. And so whatever experience you bring to the table, we can use to change what our city is. Awesome. So... Can you talk about the historic mayor election that, you know, just is going on and overall your opinions about it? So for me, it's bittersweet. It's just like in my race. So I'm in a race with another woman and I hate the woman against woman thing. It yeah. just it's not what I'm teaching my 16 year old. It's not what I'm teaching to the young woman that I mentor. It's you know, it's just it's not what I want to do. Um, but when I look at the candidates where I feel like they both have baggage, I'm concerned about somebody saying, let's turn the 50 schools into small police stations. I am because you're re-traumatizing those families who already had institutions snatched from them. And so I'm looking pros and cons to both and I'm, I'm leaning toward one I'm not gonna say but <laughs> I'm, I'm just really concerned about what you how you start is how you finish and if you start thinking that it's okay to over police our communities that's what you're going to continue to do and we all know that over policing our communities has nothing got nothing but a Laquan McDonald and Laquan wasn't the first and he want to be last if there's not things that we just change the way we do things in the city so we have one about um, one minute left. So can you tell the audience, and specifically the 20th Ward, why they should choose you in the runoff election? 
choose me for a couple of reasons. Um, my reputation is what it is. My record speaks for itself. And so I have a reputation for standing up and fighting with my community. I have a reputation for uniting and organizing around what my community wants to see. And I want us to live and retire with dignity and respect. And I am the person who will make sure that happens. And so I'm humbly asking for your vote. April 2nd, early voting starts today, punch 60. Awesome. Thank you so much for You're taking the welcome. time to come here. And thank you all so much for tuning in. Have a great day.